Good afternoon. Um, I'm Rim Raymakers with SWIFT. I'm the head of the banking and payments treasury market. And I'd like to share with you a few thoughts, indeed, following on uh, from the great introduction. And also, the, I think, Maria, in your, in your presentation, you said it's almost impossible. What is the trick uh, in terms of making payments across borders? And I don't pretend to have the solution, but I would like to share with you uh, a few of my thoughts. Um, for those who, of you who don't know SWIFT, uh, SWIFT is a, a cooperative society um, owned by the financial industry that was created in 1973 to provide a secure global uh, financial services network across the world, um, spanning about 200 countries uh, with about 10,000 uh, customers. Uh, and we also provide the connectivity into um, some domestic clearing system, high value and low value payments. And it's, it's very much that international dimension that uh, I, I would like to pick up from the topic that where Maria left it uh, and look at the international uh, dimension. The five developments that I would like to share are mainly inspired from, uh, I think, some of the previous discussions from what I see happening in the retail space. Um, traditionally, uh, the banks uh, and the financial institutions that use SWIFT use the network globally for wholesale payments, so corporate payments, institutional payments, central bank payments, but as well for retail payments. And I think it's those developments in the retail side that we see actually impacting the interbank side, which I think is a very interesting development. And basically what I think is needed is a better, stronger cooperation and innovation within the interbank space in order to service retail customers, i.e. you and me, and to provide that trick that uh, Maria was uh, calling for. So what do I see as developments impacting um, the banking sector? And I would like maybe to start off with a, a drawing from a former colleague of mine, uh, Costa Perec, who was heading the innovation team at SWIFT, who's now with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, because his drawing skills are far better than mine. And I think he kind of well illustrated uh, the issue where banks are being almost eaten in his, uh, in his drawing by um, a whole set of new entrants, be it mobile network operators deploying payment systems in many countries, um, money transfer operators, uh, also the Googles, the Amazons uh, of this world announcing also payments services. Uh, and all these new entrants into the traditional payment space create a very interesting dynamic. And underneath of that you see that the, the floor is being heated up by yet new innovation in the technology space with Bitcoin and I think my presentation is followed by uh, a colleague from the industry from Ripple, so I will, um, I will let them say uh, all the beautiful things about their uh, system and uh, their company. And I think all of this creates an interesting dynamic and probably a need to innovate for banks. But maybe a step back, why, why is uh, this such a dynamic space? Why do we see such uh, innovation? Why are there so many new entrants? So if you reverse that question, you could say, well, what's wrong? Why is our service that we get from our banks today not good enough? Why are we looking for alternatives? Well, this is a chart done by the Boston Consulting Group, and they looked at four dimensions. They looked at price, how much does it cost? They looked at speed, how fast can I make a payment? They looked at convenience, how easy is it to make a payment, and transparency. Transparency in the sense of, do I upfront know how much it's going to cost me, how long the payment will take, if the receiver actually gets the money that I want him to get, and there's no charges deducted along the chain. So along those four dimensions, without going into too much detail, I can see uh, right from this picture that indeed the bank's value proposition, and you see the, the, the colored uh, circle, uh, in terms of what banks provide to us is, well, not very compelling, uh, if we could say so. So traditionally, or typically, uh, I'm, I'm here, I'm generalizing, this is also based on some data from the World Bank, 
banks are charging more than alternatives. Um, the speed is not always, um, well, isn't real time and isn't always within the same day. It can take four to five days. Uh, the convenience with BIC and IBAN is maybe for our generation acceptable, but for the new generation looking at iPhones, they want to use uh, possibly a telephone number or an email address to have a much more easy to use service. And transparency is something that I believe we, we still don't have today. Within many countries, we do have retail payments that are fast, that are efficient, that are real time. But when you cross a border, or at least when you cross a currency, we're back to the dark ages and the payment disappears in a black hole. And you just don't know when it actually will get there. Now, to understand this, I think maybe we need just to look back in time for a second. Um, to understand how actually the banking industry is organized on a global level. So if we look at what I maybe coined correspondent banking 1.0, which I let coincide with the creation of SWIFT, let's say, in the 70s. In, in the 70s, having a long list of correspondent banks was a sign of importance. You were an established player in the financial industry. It was a show of how important and recognized you were as a bank to have a long list of correspondents. And the challenge in the 70s was really to automate transactions between those banks. Each bank was an island of systems, and there was no integrated automated communication between banks. Banks were using the telex. So that's what we automated in the 70s and in the 80s, the telex. And I think the banking industry achieved that. In the 80s and the 90s, several banks started to look internally in optimizing, in creating more efficiency within their organization. How to make payments cheaper, better, faster, more efficient, reduce the cost per payment. They started to set up global transaction banking units. They started to look at a transaction as a product and how can we make that more efficient. So really to drive down the cost, look at efficiencies of payments within an organization possibly to do payments on themselves if they had branches across the board. And I think some banks have moved on from that into what I would call a um, banking 3.0 uh, to provide the experience banking. So it's not about making a payment, but it's as uh, one of our earlier speakers said, it's about buying a television and paying for it. The payment is not something you say, oh, well, I want to make a payment. No, you want to buy a television or you want to buy a car, and then you need probably to pay for it. So I think those banks that are starting to think, how can I integrate my payment service in the e-commerce transaction have a much more integrated experience, and as a colleague earlier said, can possibly catch some of the commerce data to then mine that data and maybe even provide it back to the retail. And I think that's the challenge for banks to insert themselves into that e-commerce transaction, which actually they don't own. The e-commerce transaction is owned by the shop, by the merchant, by, by Amazon, not by a bank. So the intermediation is, is not so straightforward, I think, and may require some new partnerships, some new thinking on behalf of a financial institution. Now with that in mind, so the, to Maria's point, making a payment cross-border possibly involves two banks. If it involves two banks, it possibly involves a correspondent bank relationship because that's how banks settle payments today. And that's a business practice that dates not just from the 70s when banks automated telexes, but far before that. However, even though the value proposition of today is not great, what do we see? We see that banks are rationalizing those correspondent relationships. They're cutting them. They are closing correspondent bank relationships. You probably have seen some of these announcements by large banks where they cut relationships with other banks due to pressure of AML, of sanction screening, know your customer due diligence work, 
And actually, they're reducing, as you can see in this chart, the top 80 banks are closing their correspondent bank relationships with those banks where the volumes don't justify the cost and some of the legal implications, uh, which is in just reality in today's space. So actually, if the value proposition, if the trick of making a cross-border payment wasn't great today, I think it might get even more difficult tomorrow if there are even less direct relationships on a correspondent banking level between banks tomorrow. Which leads us back to new innovations, again, which I think in the retail space. If we think, and I think this is the next uh, development, what we are observing is that on a domestic basis, we are seeing payments go real time. We all have our phone, we want to make the payment from our phone, and we expect it to be as fast and as convenient as our phone, real time. Not wait for the payment three days, but make it in real time. And we've seen a number of countries deploy, put in those real time payment systems. Like in the UK, faster payments, like in Sweden with Swish, Singapore just gone live, Australia has an RFP out there, even the US and Canada thinking about real time payments, uh, which is a very applaudable exercise, I think. Uh, so that is what we see on the domestic side. And as we are getting used to those real time payments, I think our expectation when making a cross-border payment, what's the border in the end? It can be a neighboring country. Our expectation is going to be, I think, that those payments also need to be real time. However, if we see at how fast those payments are made, this is a chart based on data from the World Bank, those payments, at least those between banks, are not real time. They are, in the majority, taking three, four days. So I think there is a huge opportunity, you could say, for banks to improve, collaborate, look to innovate within the interbank space in order to meet the more demanding retail requirement. And I think that's an evolution that we'll see uh, over time. And just to illustrate this point once more, I think indeed these domestic, uh, so we've seen on the domestic side a lot of innovation by banks on the client channel. You probably have a banking app on your phone. I do, I actually I have two. I can reach my account from my phone here in Luxembourg and make a payment out of my account which I hold in Belgium. And I can make a payment to France. So I can access my bank account right here from, from this desk. So banks have innovated on the client channel. I can access my bank account. But that payment, will still go to another bank and then it goes back into the dark hole. I still am not told by my bank how much it's going to cost when the payment will get there. I can reach my account real time, but the payment that follows from my account is not real time. So we've seen lots of developments on the domestic side, both by banks and by non-banks. And interestingly enough, I think we are seeing lots of developments by non-banks on the international side because I think there's this hole, there's this lack of maybe innovation, development on the interbank side. And I think that pressure is there today. Banks feel it. And the question is, can banks collaborate, improve, possibly partner, maybe with some of these new entrants to actually improve that dynamic? And the underlying issue and, and again, I, I think it's really great that we also have technology companies on the panel here. But actually, I think it's not the technology that's the issue. I think it's more the business practices between banks that's the issue. You can send a payment between a bank in France and another bank in Indonesia within seconds. You can improve that with technology to reduce the second to a tenth of a second. But that does not mean that the receiving bank will process that payment in a tenth of a second. Once it hits that bank in Indonesia, or let's just turn it around, from Indonesia to Belgium, once it, or Luxembourg for that matter, once it hits the internal processes of a bank, 
it might still take one or two days before the account is actually credited. You're not sure if that bank deducts or not charges. The technology is not going to solve that. You are not sure if that bank sends back a notification. The technology is not going to solve that. It's the business practices. Even if the technology is fast and harmonized, the business practices out there today, it's a multitude of bilateral agreements which are very difficult to maintain, to establish, and to keep. And I think that's one of the issues in terms of the financial industry to look at the technology industry on one hand maybe to improve the technology but also to look at the business practices between financial institutions and coming to the technology side I think there's interesting developments interesting innovations out there um, and again I think there's other speakers in the, in the conference today and even tomorrow there are sessions on cryptocurrencies which I think is a very interesting dynamic, a very interesting innovation, which we all should look at and see how the financial industry can integrate, learn from that, and see how, at least on the technology side, maybe even on the processing side, that could help to improve. Um, so I will not maybe go too far and too deep into that, uh, and maybe just offer three thoughts of reflection on that. Uh, from my personal view. One is, again, I would like to refer to Maria when you talked about regulation um, and countries mandating not only the know your customer when you do a transaction that the provider should know its customers, but also you have to know your counterpart. You have to know who you send money to. It's not just the person that opens an account, but you need to know as a provider who the money is being sent to. Uh, today, that regulation, or at least the regulation is not clear yet, and I think the understanding by technology providers is not clear. Uh, it seems that there's like a parallel world out there, one for banks and one for non-banks and innovators. And I personally think that regulators like in Canada, they have established regulation. They're saying that even if you're a Bitcoin service provider, you will also be considered as a money service business. So you will be subject to the same regulation. You will need to know your customer. You will need to know who the money is going to. So I think that's one interesting development. Second interesting development, uh, I think, is uh, identity. So if you have to know your customer and you have to know the counterparty, how do you identify those parties? If that's with public keys, and maybe a public key is used for each transaction, how will that work? Actually, it's an open question. I would like maybe to exchange some thoughts uh, on that topic. I'm really looking forward to, to an interesting uh, exchange of, uh, of ideas on that. But I think that self-identified or you know, where your identity would be self-confirmed, some some questions and some doubts around that. Maybe it's interesting technology developments that we can learn from. Um, but that for sure is one interesting development and I wonder if banks were to use public keys to send money to each other and it would be recorded on the blockchain, that would actually, if I could identify Sberbank by its public key, I could actually go down the blockchain and see what Sberbank has done over time and how much money they have. A very interesting thought, right? As a, as a financial service provider, I, I, at least I would have some uh, concerns about that. And the last one I would like to leave you with as a, as a, as a reflection it, on, the, on this technology, and again, I would like to hear opinions on that, is um, some of these cryptocurrencies and the technologies were established as a system peer-to-peer. -peer. I think the term was used earlier in your introduction without the need of financial intermediaries. Which, okay, I work for SWIFT, which is a financial intermediary, proposing services to financial intermediaries. <laughs> so that's like a double whammy, right? Um, so I, I first went like, oh, that's interesting. Um, so if there's no need for financial intermediaries, where does that leave the financial intermediaries? 
uh, if it's really peer-to-peer. -peer. However, what I see is in the cryptocurrency space, it's creating a whole new ecosystem of intermediaries. There's wallet providers, there's exchanges, there's Bitcoin service providers, there's Bitcoin remittance providers. So actually it's creating, okay, maybe a new kind of intermediary, maybe it's not a bank, so maybe we need banking and we don't need banks. But then if these companies are subject to regulation, then their cost for AML and KYC and security and compliance and reliability and security will also go up as their transactions go up. So is it then completely disrupting the financial industry or is it just creating a new set of competitors that compete for price and service, which I think is an interesting dynamic, um, but maybe a bit at least personally disappointing in the sense that it's not as peer-to-peer -peer as at least I thought it was. But I think it's good because it creates a competitive dynamic and maybe it helps the financial industry and financial institutions actually to improve their service offering as a result of that. So I think we may all stand to benefit from that. So I, this stage would like to leave you with those five thoughts where I think we will see and we are seeing uh, significant impacts on the interbank space which are actually driven uh, by the providers of those payment services that are actually driven by the retail uh, customer base uh, side which is actually us and ourselves. Thank you very much.